Good afternoon from Ottawa and uh, welcome to ASI Canada Graduate Study Webinar number five. Uh, our Graduate Study Webinar number five is going to focus on the uh, study permit application process. And today we have uh, a very important guest who will be uh, discussing this process uh, with us. And um, that is in the person of uh, Dr. Demola Okeowo. Dr. Demola Okeowo is a Nigerian born Canadian lawyer who practices immigration law with Morton Rose Law Firm based in Vancouver, Canada. Uh, Dr. Okeowo obtained his master's in law degree from the University of Groningen in the Netherlands. He went on to obtain a second master's in law degree from the Queen's University located in Kingston, Ontario in Canada. And then subsequently his PhD in law from the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. Uh, in addition to uh, other areas of law he practices, uh, his legal practice focuses on representing clients, especially international uh, students in judicial review of immigration decisions at the Federal Court of Canada. And uh, in addition to his law practice, Dr. Okoyawo is also an adjunct professor at Fairling Dickinson University in Vancouver, British Columbia. He is a mentor to several Nigerian law students, both in Nigeria and in Canada. Dr. Okewa will be making a presentation on the Canada study permit application process. After his presentation, the floor will be open for your questions. So please feel free to type any question you might have on the chat board. Uh, after Dr. Okewa is done with his presentation, then he will have the opportunity to respond to your questions. Once again, uh, thank you very much for joining uh, uh, African Scholars Initiative Canada on our fifth graduate study webinar. Uh, we thank you for joining us from various parts of the world. I will now turn the uh, table over to Dr. Debola Okeo. All right, thank you very much, um, Professor Gideon Christian. And um, hello everyone, um, it's good to be here. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to be a part of um, the accomplishments uh, being made by the African Scholars Initiative. Um, so today I'll be discussing with you about Canadian study visa application. Um, I know from professional experience that a lot of people, you know, have ambitions. A lot of people have the intention to um, come to Canada to study. And after putting everything into the process, after much diligent effort, chances are that such kind of um, uh, you know, ambition or dreams are cut short by an immigration officer, a, a visa um, officer. And the grounds of refusal can range, you know, from the idea that um, you you are not you cannot be trusted to respect the laws of Canada, uh, in that you are not likely to leave Canada upon the completion of your study. Um, of course, the courts have already condemned that kind of um, assumption that you don't make such assumptions without evidence. And there are times also when they will say that they are refusing your application for maybe purpose of visit, or maybe for um, insufficiency of funds, you know, what we call proof of funds. Or uh, sometimes they can even say that, you know, your choice of program is questionable. So today, um, the presentation will be focusing um, on on some of these areas. Now, before I move forward, just to confirm, everybody is seeing my my um, my present my PowerPoint, right? Uh, Professor Kristen, can you see my my PowerPoint presentation? Yeah. Uh, yes, I can see your PowerPoint. So I presume every other person can see it. I, I can see it as well. Yes, I can see okay. it as well. 
Great. Okay. So uh, I'm actually not seeing um, everyone again, but that's okay. So I assume you are there some, somehow. <laughs> actually, we can see you too and the PowerPoint. Oh, you can see me. Okay. That's great. That's fantastic. Okay. So um, let's um, make progress here. So I want to start the presentation by, of course, I, I know that uh, not all of us here today are lawyers, uh, but the common thing we have is that whether you are, you are a lawyer or not, you have to go through this process if you want to come to Canada for um, study purposes. So it's very important for you to have an understanding of the uh, legal framework you know, that inform um, how the application is processed and, and determined or assessed. So there are, of course, several frameworks, but the, the, the principal ones are the ones I have indicated on the screen, which is the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act. And going forward, I will refer to it as the IRPA. Um, and of course, um, the Immigration and Refugee Protection Regulations. And going forward, I will refer to that as IRPR. Um, Section 11.1 of the IRPA sets out the, the basic legal framework. And it says, I mean, foreign national must apply for a visa before entering Canada. Um, it's a requirement and that they must also meet the requirements of the IRPA. So interestingly, these requirements are not really indicated in section 11.1, but they are scattered around in the IRPA as well as in the IRPR. Now the IRPR, for example, in section 212 and 213, um, says that foreign national may not study in Canada unless authorized by the IRPA. And of course, foreign national shall apply for a study permit before entering Canada for study purposes. So, you know, initially we said that um, section 11.1 says student, I mean, if you are coming as a foreign national, you must apply for visa and secondly, uh, you must meet the requirement of the IRPA. So what are these requirements? What are the requirements of the law? And not just limited to the IRPA, but even the IRPR. Now, this requirement from experience, they are numerous. Um, sometimes they are even you know, confusing and they can even overlap. Now, they range from uh, a foreign national showing that he or she is not inadmissible to demonstrating that he or she will live Canada at the end of their authorized period of study. Now, the second leg seems to be the fulcrum, you know, the focus um, where most applications are denied. The idea that on the face of the application, um, it, it's not clear that the applicant will leave Canada at the end of their, of their study. And they can tie this into your funds, like proof of funds, they can tie it into your purpose of study. They can tie this into um, uh, your choice of program, you know, and you know several other range of reasons like, like that. And for those who really want to um, look deep into it, into this, um, you can also check. In addition to section 11.1, you can check section 21B of the IRPA, section 179 and 216.1 of the IRPR. Now, the main conditions for insurance of study permit, they are actually um, indicated under section 216A to E um, of the IRPR. And it says that th the first one is that you must apply for the study permit in accordance with the IRPR. You must make that application in accordance with the regulation and B, says you must leave Canada, like I said earlier, at the end of the period authorized for your stay. And C, you must meet the requirements of the IRPR. You can see that requirement is a recurrent term. You know, the, 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 the laws keep talking about requirement, requirements. And it gives, you know, the um, visa processing officers the, the opportunity, like a very, um, a very big uh, framework within which to maneuver to make decisions. Some of them um, endorsed by the federal court, some of them overruled sometimes, especially when they are arbitrary and they are 
um, not, you know, they are not justifiable by logic and the law. And of course, 261 1D talks about that you must meet the requirements um, of subsections 32 and 3 of the IRPA if they must submit to a medical examination under paragraph 16.2b of the, of the law. So we are likely familiar with the idea of you know, medicals um, when it comes to um, study parameter application. Now, it's different from the biometrics that will come shortly after you submit your application. The medicals, and for those of us in this business um, or in this area of law, um, it is always assumed that once they get to the point where they are asking you to, to, to go do um, an expansive medical examination, that's a prima facie evidence that your application would be approved. Chances are, it's not conclusive, but in 99% of cases, um, that's always going to be the case. And of course, um, sub, sub, sub E also says that, that you must have been admitted or accepted to undertake a program of study at a designated learning institution in Canada. And that's very important. For those of us in Africa, we always have this assumption that all schools you know, in, in a developed country like Canada, they are all accredited, they are all designated. That's not always the case. Um, as we have mushrooms, um, schools and institutions in Africa, we also have schools like that here. Um, sometimes a whole institution might not actually be more than um, a room. You know, a whole, a whole school might probably just be, be run under a three bedroom, you know, flat. So you wanna be sure that the school you are applying to um, is a designated learning institution in Canada. It's very important. It actually also fits into the overall um, assessments of your, of your application. Now, again, that is also one major important document that is often um, ignored or not emphasized enough. And experience has shown that this document, um, among others, but principally, this document is very, very instrumental, is very, very um, significant in terms of the processing of your visa application. So it's called the, the personal statement. Sometimes people call it motivation letter um, or statement of purpose. All right. Now, the the, the um, significance of this document was particularly underscored in at least two cases um, decided by the Federal um, Court of Canada. So the first one, uh, Penis and Canada Citizenship and Immigration decided in 2017. And just by, by way of a rough note, let me just give you like a summary of that case as well. So it was um, a Turkish national who had applied to study here in Canada for tourism um, the applicant made, applied to one of the schools here in Vancouver, British Columbia. Now, the applicant already had um, a bachelor's degree in tourism in their country. And they were applying into Seneca, um, um, what is this school now? Capilano University uh, for a diploma program in tourism. And so the application was refused. Uh, on some grounds, which includes that it was unreasonable for the applicant to come here um, or to say they wanted to come here to study for a diploma in tourism when they already had a bachelor's degree you know, in tourism and that taken together with the rest of the content in the application, um, it was not clear that the applicant's purpose of coming here was reasonable and overall that um, they were not satisfied that the applicant was going to depart or leave this country upon the completion of their program. So the applicant, of course, um, applied to the Federal Court for Judicial Review. And in agreeing with the applicant, uh, the Federal Court held that it was wrong and unreasonable to have refused the application on the ground that it was not clear that the applicant was going to leave Canada, especially because in the applicant's personal statement, the applicant made it very clear um, time and again that she was going to leave Canada. The applicant also even 
um, indicated her plans, you know, upon return to her country, she said she would probably be interested in going into tourism, you know, having her own business, set up hotel, hotel business, you know, um, and that the certificates she would get from Canada um, added with her existing bachelor's degree would assist her to hit the ground running and to um, excel, you know, in that area or field of tourism. So the court held that the fact that the applicant indicated in the personal statement that they were returning, that they were going to leave Canada, that it was sufficient evidence for the visa officer to have considered and deciding against that was unreasonable. The same thing, if you look at the second case, uh, Kavugo Missions and Canada Citizenship and Immigration, it was also the personal statement that saved the applicant. Um, the application was um, denied, um, I think in January of 2016. Um, by the way, Kavugo, Ms. Kavugo was um, uh, an African applicant from the DRC, Democratic Republic of Congo. And so she, had already, you know, um, gone through the master's program, um, I think in chemical engineering uh, in South Korea from 2010 to 2016. And the intention was to come to Canada for a PhD in one of the schools in Quebec, uh, also for um, chemical engineering, you know, the same area of, of, of um, discipline. And so the application was denied in January of 2016. Now, Ms. Kavugo was meant to resume in May of 2016, but in January of that year, her application was denied among other grounds that there was no evidence that she would depart Canada, that she would leave the country upon the completion of her program. Ms. Kavugo immediately reapplied uh, I think, you know, a day or two uh, or thereabout. And that reapplication was not assessed. It was not um, attended to until around August of 2016. And just so you know, that's actually one of the things that they do sometimes if they are not really interested, you know, in, in your application. Um, an officer can decide to just put it somewhere uh, or delay, you know, progress on it. Um, we have had to made uh, to make um, applications for mandamus uh, in deserving cases, you know, um, asking the court to compel um, Citizenship and Immigration Canada to decide a particular case because I mean sometimes the case can take forever, and they employ sort kind of delay tactics to even discourage you as an applicant. I mean, for example, if your school is to resume in May, and by April you still haven't heard anything about your um, application. May, no response. June, July. I mean, it's taken as given for many of us who will have, you know, decided or probably concluded that the application wasn't going anywhere. And such kind of nightmare will come to reality as it came to reality in the case of Ms. Kavugo in August of 2016, when the visa officer as well, you know, um, insisted that she was not, or he or she was not satisfied that Ms. Kavugo was going to leave Canada upon the completion of her program. And so when she made um, a judicial review application to the federal court, um, the judge was particularly upset, you know, about um, that decision. I mean, that decision. And the judge said, this applicant has already indicated in their personal statements that they were going to leave Canada upon the completion of their program. In fact, they also indicated their plans, you know, uh, upon returning to um, their, their country, in this case, Democratic Republic of Congo. The applicant had indicated that, you know, people like her um, would be celebrated, would be um, uh, respected, you know, upon return. Uh, because, I mean, the idea of, you know, having foreign degrees and all of those things uh, in most African countries, it's a big deal. And that she looked, she looked forward to contributing, you know, or returning back to her country to contribute to the economic and social development of, of our country. The judge weighed in on all of those um, statements in the applicant's personal statement and said it was unreasonable that the officer could not have um, jettisoned or ignored, you know, um, that piece of evidence and decide that the applicant was not going to leave Canada. So that decision was overruled. It was 
labeled as unreasonable and arbitrary, and the application was ordered to be re redetermined. So you don't want to um, toil with your personal statement. In fact, like I said earlier, uh, the most important piece of evidence, as far as I'm concerned, and particularly from experience, um, is your personal statement. Everybody would put in, I mean, the uh, application forms, they are generic. You have no way to circumvent or to avoid that. As a matter of fact, many of them, if you do not, if you missed anything out, you are not likely to be able to generate some codes or to save them, or sometimes even to upload them online. So there are a lot of security um, features on them. So everybody would get the generic forms right. What is not um, generic, what is not common to everyone, uh, is not just the personal statement, but the quality of the personal statement, this, the content, the substance of that personal statement. It's very important. And I would try to highlight some of the uh, things that you must consider when putting together your personal statement. So what must it contain? Now, this is not an exhaustive list, all right? But I just put this together based on my own personal professional experience and how it has worked for um, several of my clients uh, in the past, and it is still working for many of them um, um, at the moment. So you must indicate in that personal letter why you want to study for the proposed course in Canada and not in your country or any other country. You must give a justification, a compelling justification why you want to study that proposed course in Canada. Why can't you go to Ghana? Why can't you go to the US? Why this country? All right, you must be able to put up reasonable justification uh, for that. And that must be indicated in your personal statement. Also, that you will understand your responsibilities as a student in Canada. It's very important for most of us um, coming from that part of the world, that is always a presumption of law breaking, all right? Um, that when you get here, you're not likely to respect the rules, you're not likely to respect laws, but you want to make it clear. Now, not because you are stupid, not because um, uh, it's very important, but as, as an insurance, all right, for you in the unlikely event that your application is denied on that ground. Now, if that goes before um, a federal court under judicial review, the fact that you, are, you already indicated that in your personal statement would count against any you know, um, contrary decision or opinion on that, on that ground. You also need to indicate that you recognize that your stay in Canada is temporary. All right, that is a general presumption in law. Um, as a general rule, people coming into this country are presumed to be immigrants. So whether you are coming as a visitor or you are coming to work or you are you're coming to study, the law um, has a presumption that you are an immigrant. And particularly for um, international students, the onus is on you, the responsibility is on you to rebut that presumption. All right, that even though you are coming to Canada, you are not intending to be here permanently. You have a purpose of coming here and that you are temporary. Once your program um, finishes, that you would leave this country and return um, to your country. It's very important that you make that clear in black and white in your personal statement. Also, that you will obey all laws and regulation um, of Canada while you study. So that somehow fits into the second point um, about that you understand your responsibilities. All right, understanding your responsibilities um, means that once you get here as a student, um, you know that as a student, you are supposed to go to school. You are supposed to participate, you know, in the academic and social life of, of the school. You are, you are supposed to be, um, um, to, to, I mean, you know, not abandon your, your studies and focus more on working and all of those things. So when you now look at that also in the light of um, obeying all laws and regulation, you know, the document given to you um, is, is the study permit. Now, what, what will be given to you initially will be the study visa, all right? But upon entry into the, um, this, this, the, the, the border here, 
um, you will be issued the study permit and that document would have some restrictions. It will tell you what you can and cannot do. And so you have to stand by those um, responsibilities and, 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 and obligations. You have to ensure you do not violate the terms of your stay. Otherwise, that may be a ground for your removal, even before your program um, concludes. In that personal statement as well, you also must um, show that you have ties to your country, such as, you know, like spouse, if you are married, children, if you have them, uh, parents, if they are still, you know, alive, um, siblings, you know, if any, job, ambition, you know, all of those things. You cannot um, talk too much in your personal statement. That's actually the way I see it. You have to empty your mind. You know, you have to let them know what, you know, um, what may be the reason why you are not likely going to stay a day longer um, than expected. That's your country, you know, you have things there, you have people there um, that you need to return to. Don't present an appearance of, of desperation, you know, um, that yes, you know, it is do or die. My country, you know, is, um, I mean, the wheels are going off. Uh, I need to just escape before everything blows. That will not get you anywhere. In fact, that is going to get you a refuser. But you want to maintain a balanced head, all right? You know what you have. And so in your um, writing, you are not being proud, um, but you are at the same time letting them know that you are even coming to add value, of course, to the system um, in, in Canada. You are coming to contribute you know, to the economic life also in Canada and that you have people. I mean, that one not, notwithstanding, you have people and obligations and things in Nigeria or in your country, uh, whatever that is, that um, would necessitate your return. Also, if you are working uh, in that personal statement, you need to indicate that current job or vocation um, and especially highlight the achievements um, in that job as well. So if you have been um, um, selected as maybe the employee of the month or you've attended you know, um, conferences um, or you've been given some kind of um, grant or, or um, award, you know, all of those things, you have to you know, show them. If you have got those things, you have to show them. You are not being proud. You are just letting them know that you have done very well for yourself. So I know that many of us Africans, we like to be very modest and all of those things. No, you have to demonstrate, you have to show to them, you know, you have to brandish all of those accomplishments that um, you have, just so they know that you're already a success and that coming to Canada is gonna be a bipartisan benefit, not just only to your country, but also to um, Canada as well, if you're um, allowed in, if your application is granted. Now, if you are working as well, um, you need to also indicate that your, your current employer gave you a study leave to undertake the proposed course in Canada. Because you know these guys that process your application, they can be finicky sometimes. They are always looking for you know, uh, a hole, you know, a reason to refuse or deny your application. So if you indicate, for example, in my last point about um, your current job and the achievements that you've um, made and that you are making in that job, and you stop short of indicating that you are coming here on a study leave or that your employer is aware or that your employer has given you authorization to do that. You know, someone may say, well, we don't know. I mean, you seem to be doing very well uh, in that job. We, we have no idea whether or not um, there are arrangements, you know, for you as to when you leave or whether you are going to return or whether your employer uh, would allow you, you know, to, 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 to leave, especially bearing in mind the achievements that you have indicated, um, how likely will it be for an employer to say bye or to let you go? So you need to you know, also address that part in your personal statement to say that, you know, you, you, you have already discussed with your employer and that you'll be studying, um, you'll be coming to Canada on that study leave. Um, and to, to say that, you must also ensure to seek and obtain um, you know, this 
um, permission or information from your employer. It's very important. Otherwise, uh, you don't want to lie. You don't want to misrepresent because those are also very serious um, issues with serious consequences under the legal framework here, under the IRP and the IRP, IRPR in Canada. There is also the idea that you want to emphasize that you will return to your country upon the completion of your study. You will see that this theme is recurrent. And some of you say, for me, I mean, the reason why I'm actually leaving my country is so that I will never return to the country. Now, um, it is not yet the time for you to make that known you know, to the government um, of Canada. When you are at the stage of applying for your permanent residency, now that application by itself suggests that you want to remain permanent in this country. But the application you are dealing with right now by its nature is temporary. So you don't want to give the impression that you are you know, um, jetting out, you are completely you know, running away from your country. So you always want to make sure you specify that you are going to return to your country uh, upon the completion of your program. When I applied for the permit um, several years ago, um, of course, I knew that um, beyond my studies, I wanted to um, become, you know, a permanent resident and ultimately become a, a Canadian citizen. Um, but that was not the right time to make that kind of, you know, um, disclosure because you want to take each day as um, it comes. So I simply just applied for study permit. I told them, of course, that I, I'm returning to my country. And even as I'm speaking to you right now, of course, I'm still returning to my country. Um, the, the issue is when are you doing that, all right? But you need to you know, say the right word at the right time. That's the essence of uh, what, what we are saying here. And um, also, you also need to give a brief description of your plans, goals, and aspirations upon return to your country. In the two cases I mentioned earlier, the Penis case and the Kavugo mission case, um, those applicants, they didn't, they didn't only just indicate that they were returning to their country. They also gave uh, statements, you know, with regards to their goals, their plans, their aspirations, what they um, wanted to do once they returned to their country. Those are very, very um, important as well. Okay, so if you now want to look at um, purpose of visit, um, for those who may have applied before and perhaps who went through the unpleasant experience of being refused or denied, you know that um, applications can be denied on several grounds and one of the grounds can be purpose of visit. And sometimes it can be very um, jarring that they don't expatiate on this. As a matter of fact, sometimes on the um, decision um, forms, they are just boxes that someone somewhere will just tick the boxes and leave you in limbo, leave you wondering. So what does this mean? Uh, how did I get this wrong? Um, if you want to turn around to see the, the reasoning behind those check boxes, um, I mean, a few things can be done. You can, in fact, apply for what they call the GCMS notes, and that would um, give you uh, a better idea. Uh, it is not the case that they are even so elaborate in the GCMS note, but at least they go far and above um, just ticking the box that they send to you. So they give um, some explanations um, to justify, you know, the, the uh, boxes that they have checked uh, for you. So for purpose of visit, uh, for which an application could be uh, refused, uh, you need to show that you have genuine intention. That is central to this um, issue here. You need to show that you have genuine intention. The, the processing officer, upon reviewing your materials and application, must be able to come to that destination or that position where they will be convinced, I mean, on a balance of probability that your intention is truly to come here to study. If there is any kind of you know, um, um, doubt about that, so for example, if you have made or, or, or gave indications that may appear to an officer that your intention is in fact to remain here permanently, that can be fatal to your study permit application. So you need to show you have genuine intention 
to study in Canada. And you can set out um, this intention clearly in your personal statement. So you have to set out your personal educational and career goals and how these tie with your proposed education in Canada. So your personal educational and career goals and how these tie with your proposed education in Canada. There must be a connection. There must be a common theme um, running through uh, all of those areas of your life to justify you know, your purpose of visits into this country as a student. You also need to justify the choice of the institution you are coming to in Canada above and beyond other institutions, All right? So if, for example, you're coming for an MBA, for example, uh, there are some schools in this country that are known, you know, um, for their expertise um, when it comes to MBA. Queen's University in Kingston, for example, is a very good example. Um, it's known as, you know, highly proficient, highly respected, you know, when it comes to MBA, you know, and so you want to put that in your state personal statement that I'm not just coming into Canada. Uh, I'm not just going to any school. I'm going to this so, so, so school. And this is the reason why I have chosen this school to actualize my um, graduate educational um, goals and, and ambition. So that's very important. That would, again, tie into that overall uh, purpose of visit. You also need to highlight compelling reasons why you cannot undertake that particular program, that particular course in your country, all right? Um, some of them, I've, I've even read um, GCMS notes where the visa officer uh, was specifically even listing schools in some countries that this course that you are seeking to undertake in Canada, uh, the same course exists in, you know, and they will list the, the name of schools and that they wonder why you are not thinking about going to those schools uh, for, for that kind of course, but you must come here. So you need to think deeply. You need to make sure you come up with a compelling reason, you know, why you cannot undertake that proposed course in your, in your country um, of, of residence or your country of origin. And the reasons can be, I mean, there cannot be a closed list as to the reasons. Um, so for example, it could be that um, you, I mean, maybe that's, that's, um, that's, Maybe in your country, um, there are always um, some kind of, um, uh, I would say, impediments, you know, like maybe um, stumbling blocks, um, maybe uncertainty, you know, about uh, the length of time um, that it will take you to complete that program. That can be a fantastic and compelling justification because whatever you say about your country, these guys have a um, list of countries with developments and happenings in those countries. They have documents on each country, you know, indicating the social political affairs in, in each country. So whatever you say, especially if it ties into their own record, that can be very compelling. Um, that can also be very truthful as well. And your truthfulness may also weigh in in the mind of the processing officer. Um, and like I said earlier, you also need, you know, I cannot overemphasize that, justify your choice of Canada, justify your choice of Canada. Uh, you know, you need to show why you couldn't have gone into, you know, schools in uh, one of the countries in Europe, or, or perhaps, you know, um, gone to China. Um, why here? Why Canada? You need to think deeply um, and give justifications, you know, for that. So all of those taken together um, would fall or maybe treated um, as, you know, purpose of visit and may weigh in uh, in the mind of the visa processing officer to refuse, uh, to which I, I hope, uh, rather than, sorry, to approve, to which I hope, rather than refuse your application. So choice of program. Um, you also see that there are times when an application uh, can be refused on this ground, you know, choice of program. And so you want to ensure that the program you applied to uh, aligns with your academic and employment history. You know, the program you have applied to, you want to show some kind of connection, you know, with your previous academic history 
and um, either previous or current employment history. It's very important. So if you are like a butterfly, you know, that, that flies all around, um, today you are studying um, um, and engineering, and then tomorrow you are in um, biotechnology, you know, and next tomorrow you have interest in law. Um, and then after that, you intend to take up another vocation in dentistry. That is going to be problematic, okay? Except you are able to tie each of them um, to one another. Now, it is also advisable to accent in your educational pursuit, to accent in your educational pursuit and not descend. So for example, um, bachelor's degree to master's degree to PhD and not, for example, master's degree. And then you suddenly thought about, okay, a diploma in communication, um, a certificate in, in, um, in, in computer you know, literacy. Uh, you need to, now it is not, I'm not saying that you cannot even make that kind of progression. You can, so long as you can justify, you can connect the dots, you can link them, you know, as to why this is now what you want to do at the moment. Now, while it is very risky, you may decide, in fact, to descend, like I said earlier, in your educational pursuit, so long as your academic and your employment history align with the program. So it is not the case that if you decide to descend, that a visa application would, uh, a visa officer would refuse your application. Um, I would say in my experience, most likely um, they would, most likely. But there are times when they may not. And sometimes even when it is refused on that ground and you do a judicial review, um, a court will be likely, you know, a trial of fact will be likely to agree with you uh, than agreeing with Immigration Canada on that. If you look at this particular case of Penis and Canada uh, that I gave you, um, I, I gave the summary of that case uh, earlier. So in that case, for example, like I said, the applicant already had a bachelor's degree in tourism and yet they were applying into Canada for a diploma in tourism. And specifically, the reviewing officer, the visa officer, um, made notes on that. And you know, he or she indicated that it didn't make sense to them that you already have, I mean, a bachelor's degree, and then you're coming here for diploma, that uh, um, you are coming to take up a low, that was actually the language, a low program. And so for that reason, the, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the visa officer indicated that that's actually tied into um, our, our own perception, uh, is our own perception of the general purpose of visits of the applicant and that it was unreasonable for the applicant to be in this country. But at the federal court of Canada, um, the judge actually disagreed and the judge said, that is even the reason why such applications should be approved and that so long as they are still in the same discipline. So in this case, this applicant already had bachelor's degree in tourism. They are coming for diploma in tourism. The judge held that it was still the same you know, field, tourism and tourism. And that the fact that this applicant already had that um, bachelor's experience would even help them you know, to hit the ground running uh, when they start their diploma in Canada. And that if they were coming for diploma program in an unrelated course, then he may be inclined to agree with Immigration Canada. But in this case, because they are in the same course that the applicant was able to connect the dots and that it was unreasonable to refuse it on that ground. So like I said earlier on, um, you may try that, but it is risky, risky in the sense that um, your application will be initially refused and you don't want to get your study visa through the courts. I'm not saying that's not good, but you have to bear in mind that it will take you time. Uh, for example, if you have to do a judicial review, for example, the earliest time that you can expect a result should be at least two years from now, the earliest. So which means it will affect a lot of things, okay? You have to put that study on hold 
you have to apply to the school for um, suspension of um, or, or, or what we call deferment of your admission. Um, and of course, other things. So you don't want to really um, uh, go that path. You want to do the right thing and get it right once and for all. Also, you also need to think about the expenses to go to the federal court. You need to hire a lawyer to do that, uh, not an immigration consultant because they cannot even go to court. You know, but to hire a lawyer in this country, it's a lot of money. Um, ask me about it because I know. So, and many applicants, particularly those from the uh, African region, are not likely to be able to raise such kind of funds to litigate such uh, review at the Federal Court of Canada. And then, of course, the last point here, um, which is proof of funds. Uh, you also may have noticed that for those who have probably had experience about applying for study visa, that an application can be refused on this ground uh, as well, proof of funds. And you need to you know, indicate clearly, if you don't want your application to be refused on this ground, indicate clearly in your application uh, and personal statements, who will be responsible for your expenses in Canada? It's very important. Who will be ex responsible for your expenses in Canada? Now I know people have um, a lot of um, source of you know um, a lot of sources of sponsorship, you know. Um, some people would indicate their uncle, aunt, and all of those things, or sometimes even um, maybe boyfriend, you know, girlfriends, and all of those things. Now those are not likely to fly that much, because a reasonable officer would say. Um, we look into how likely it is for uh, your uncle with his own personal and family responsibilities to go out of his way to not be focusing on you to make such an investment on you or your aunt you know the same reasons may apply or worst case scenario your your um who knows boyfriend girlfriend that's not going to fly that's even laughable okay because there is actually no obligation in a way, at least in the eye of the law, you know, on that individual to um, keep their own end of the bargain. They are likely going to bail on you at the end of the day. And if there is anything that this country doesn't like, it is the idea that someone intends to come here and then rely on public funds, you know, to, um, for, for, for their expenses. Um, that's gonna be a no-no. So, Scholarship is preferred. Now, I know it is not everyone that can get scholarship, but one of the things that you must consider when you are um, seeking the appropriate institution um, of study is the availability of funds for that program that you are interested in. Even if it is not full funding, um, any funding, no matter how little, is sufficient. And that's because the idea that an institution in this country is willing to make an investment um, on you. There's a way that also weighs in the mind of visa processing officers that a school is willing to make an investment. You know, even if it's as little as 1,000 or 2,000 Canadian dollars, it's, it goes a long way. So for me, scholarship is preferred. But like I said, not everyone may get that. So what are the other ways of proving um, funds? Um, you can use your own personal um, um, account, your savings, or your spouse, if you are married, all right? So if you are coming to study um, and you are working, um, you may want to show your own personal account statement if you are married, or that of your spouse, or a combination of both, all right? If you are, if you are unmarried um, and maybe you are not working, it may be advisable to you know, um, submit account statements of your parents um, and ensure that you're not, you're not submitting account statements of your parents in addition to your uncle's account statement. Just leave all those extended family, leave them out of this because it's not going to fly. It's not going to assist you at all. Um, of course, that's not like a general rule. I mean, I have read at least in a case, in one case decided by the federal court uh, where the judge, you know, um, considered the fact that an uncle, in addition to the parent of the applicant, that the applicant's uncle, who was very affluential, very rich, was also willing um, to assist with 
expenses in Canada. In fact, the uncle went above and beyond. He gave what we call an affidavit of support. So which means um, the, the uncle gave statements under the penalty of perjury, you know, gave statements on oath. Now, those kind of statements, of course, you should know that they will weigh high in the mind of the court. But don't forget that this case I'm talking about already got to the court, which meant that at the assessment level, at the Immigration Canada level, it was denied. So you always want to make sure you get it right first. You are not preparing to go and litigate. So whatever you are putting together, you are having the mindset to make sure you get your study permit approved, you know, once and for all without thinking that, okay, I'm just going to dare them. I'm just going to take some risk. And if they refuse, I'll go to the federal court. You can do that, but it will take years and it will be expensive as well. So there is actually no legal requirement to show funds covering the entire duration of your program. So for example, if you are coming here for an MBA, uh, which for most schools here, it takes two years to complete uh, an MBA program. There is no legal requirement that you have to show funds that you cover the entire duration, two years. Or if you are coming for um, a four year program or five year, like a doctoral program, for example, there's no legal requirement that says you must show funds that cover the entire duration. What is required, however, is evidence of funds. And in my own professional experience, that evidence um, always is the bank statement. It is sufficient to include bank statements. I know that people also include, you know, um, um, share certificate, bond, you know, landed property and blah, blah, blah. Uh, I'm not discouraging that, um, but I don't think that really uh, weigh so much, that much. What they really want is your bank statement, how much is there? And that bank statement, of course, you know, there must be evidence of transactions in it, not just a deposit of lump sum, a few days to the time that you're gonna apply for the visa. That's going to raise, raise some red flags and the application will ultimately um, most, you know, certainly be denied. So what is required is evidence of funds sufficient to take care of financial expenditures for the first year of the program. So the magic word is first year, not the first three months or the first six months, first year of the program. Now, in a case called Sajakova and Canada Citizenship and Immigration, uh, the judge in that case actually held that the applicant's ability to fund the first year of the proposed cost of studies is the primary consideration. After that, an applicant need only demonstrate a probability of future sources of funding. That's all you need. That's what is required. And of course, full tuition fee payment is highly recommended, okay? Full tuition payment is highly recommended as a general rule. And I know and I understand that not everyone may be able to, you know, afford um, full tuition payment, particularly, you know, when, when converting our African currencies to the Canadian dollar, you know, it can be um, fortune, it can be a lot of money. Uh, in terms of um, you know, uh, paying tuition. But if you can afford it, it is always advisable to pay full funding. In fact, that actually put paid, that's actually um, you know, um, silences any kind of naysayer, any kind of dissenting view, because it makes your case very strong. There is no reason to refuse this application. I have made the full payment. And I can tell you almost certainly that if such a case is denied, um, and you intend to do a judicial review, even the lawyers at the Justice Department Canada would not likely allow you to go to court because they know that the court may, you know, um, hold some very strong words um, against them. So they are likely going to set you and persuade you to withdraw your application and assure you that they would reconsider that application. They will get back to the processing office and that they will reconsider the application. So, but if you cannot afford the full tuition, um, I would say the minimum that you must think about paying should be at least 60% of the tuition, at least 60%. Again, I am talking from experience. I have tried 20 before, I have tried 40 before, and those never worked out, all right? But the moment we tried, you know, we raised the threshold to 60%, it was working for us, you know, like, um, I don't know how to say it. So 
that is always something you want to work towards. And evidence of the available funds must be more than 10,000. So your account statement, after paying the tuition or maybe the deposit, okay, the account statement you are going to submit must have not more than 10,000. It must be more than 10,000 because generally speaking, it is, it is believed that 10,000 is sufficient for your accommodation and living cost for one year. So if you submit an account statement of just 5,000, that may be a reason why your application may be refused on proof of funds ground. So you always want to make sure that the funds in that account um, is way more than 10,000 Canadian dollars. All right, so closing thoughts now. Um, I, I know that, you know, for many of us, we've been thinking about this for, for years. You know, we've been nursing this ambition um, to, you know, have a Canadian degree um, to study um, in, a, in, 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 in uh, a developed country like Canada. And so by the time you get to the point of submitting your application, I can tell you, I know that you have come a long way. I know that submission of that application um, is the culmination of years of efforts, diligence, hard work, um, you know, dreams, and perhaps sleepless nights, you know, about, you know, um, actualizing that dream. And so a decision that discourages those kind of years of effort um, can be very devastating. So if you receive a negative decision, chances are that you are going to be very you know, sad about that. Now, you don't have to give up, okay? You always want to you know, look into the reasons for that refusal and take the necessary steps. So if it is possible, address the issues if any, and reapply. Now, and I said, if any, because there are times when there may not be any reasonable, I mean, explanation for the refusal. Everything that ought to have been done um, was done. You crossed your T's, you dotted your I, and yet somewhere, someone somewhere still felt, yeah, you're not gonna get into this country. Now, in that kind of situation, you might need to talk to a very brilliant, and note that I didn't say a good immigration consultant, I said brilliant, because brilliant is what you want in that category for immigration consultants. Uh, many of them have no idea what they are doing, and I'm not saying this to um, cast as passion on them, I'm talking from personal experience as well. Um, so you want to hire a very brilliant immigration consultant, um, or preferably, a lawyer to assist. Now, even the issue of immigration consultants, what they can do at best at that level of refusal is to maybe assist with what we call reconsideration, all right? They cannot go to the federal court on your behalf for a judicial review of that um, refused visa application. So in that case, if that's actually what you want to do, um, then you preferably want to hire a lawyer um, to assist you. Um, in all, I wish you all the very best and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Okeo for, I mean, this is a very um, brilliant, detailed discussion on the um, study permit application process. And um, I will probably want to turn the table, I mean, turn attention over to some of the questions we have on the chat box. So if you have any question on the chat box based on the presentation by Dr. Okeo or um, something outside the presentation that is uh, related to study permit application, please feel free to leave your question on the chat box. I mean, chat box. But let me. Um, bring some question from my end uh, for you, Dr. Okay, well, I mean, these are just some of the things I want you to kind of, uh, maybe if you can further elaborate on them, that would be fantastic. Okay. The issue of um, 
you know, the applicant proving that they will depart at the end of uh, the authorized period of stay. Uh, right. I believe in many cases, the court has held that uh, uh, the applicant really does not um, need to leave Canada at the end of their study. What it simply means is that they should take steps to, you know, maintain a valid immigration status at the end of their stay. So that means that even when you successfully come in, Yes. And when you complete your program, you don't say, oh, when I was applying for my study permit, I promised them that I was going to leave at the end of my study, so I'll have to leave. No, you are not obligated to leave. That is correct. But, yeah. So what I want you to address further now is on the issue of uh, dual intention. And this is also related to dual intention. Yes. Sorry. Okay. So can you uh, maybe say one or two things about that, about dual intention and... Uh, What's your advice for and against? I mean, I know you've spoken about this earlier, but if you can emphasize on it, that would be excellent. Uh, the immigration and IRPA allows for dual intention, which means you can have the intention of coming here to stay temporarily, as well as an intention to come and stay permanently. Both can go together. But what are the dangers of, you know, bringing that dual intention open at the initial stage? Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Professor. Um... Christian. Now, we need to bear in mind that, of course, we have a legal framework for virtually everything that is done in, in this country. Um, and to what extent these frameworks or these policies are being um, reasonably applied is a different question entirely, all right? Uh, particularly when it relates to um, you know, um, people of our kind of descent. And I'm, not, I'm saying this with every sense of purpose, and I'm saying this also based on experience. So this is not to be taken as some kind of um, um, defaming you know, um, the immigration system. I have experiences to justify every single word I have made today. I know that there are times when there are separate kind of rules that apply to you know, applicants from our part of the world. And so the idea of dual intention or making it known also can be very risky as well, all right? I say that, um, I mean, apart from not really uh, disclosing, like if, you, if your intention is to be here permanently, but you want to come in by way of um, study permits, leave each day as they come. That's my advice, okay? Focus at the moment on that temporary um, resident visa that you're applying for. Now, like Professor uh, um, Kristen um, mentioned, a while ago. It is not illegal for you to remain in this country upon the completion of your program. What you need to bear in mind is that you are still within the ambit of the law. You are still, you know, you have a valid legal status. You are still holding your own end of the bargain very well. And from that, you can move from temporary resident status to permanent resident status and from there to citizenship, uh, citizenship status. Many of us went through that kind of pathway, all right? Now, it may take time for, for, for some people. It may even be very fast for others. The one thing you need to bear in mind is that you cannot compare your case with someone else. Just focus on your own life and allow things to work as they work for you. So the dual intention, I would say, I would not recommend that you should even give any scintilla of hints that you intend to, um, um, stay permanently. Now, I'm not saying you cannot, but chances are that you are likely going to get your study permit at the Federal Court of Canada, not from Immigration Canada. And like I said earlier, that, that comes with its own consequences, like expenses, you know, gnashing of teeth, um, you know, like unreasonable, you know, um, stress, depression, and waste of time, um, really. So you don't want to do that. So just keep all of those things into your mind. And beyond that, even beyond talking to um, immigration, even in your own social network, if it is possible, all of these steps that you are taking, you don't need to go on social media and start them. I just submitted my application for study, for study permit today, like we do nowadays, right in this age of social media. You don't need publicity. You don't need to tell people, even within your family cycles, only give information that matters, not unsolicited information. Don't worry about you know, boasting that you have already submitted. Submission is not an achievement. Okay, getting the visa is. So that's my response to that. 
Oh, thank you, um, Dr. Okay, well, let me quickly ask one question before we now turn to Mariam, who will be asking the questions on the chat box. And this is also related to your presentation. And um, of course, coming from Africa, um, most of us know that if you're working for an employer and they get to know, okay, this person is having this plan to travel abroad to study, some of them actually don't look at you in good light. And one of the points you highlighted in your presentation is, you know, trying to get in, like a reference letter from your employers. In some cases, a lot of people are reluctant of speaking about this progress with their employers until they're sure they have their study permits. Yes. How will they go about being able to address this aspect of the application process? That is being able to, you know, apply for this process while keeping their employers in the dark out of fear of I mean, retaliation. Should they make it known to the employer that they are planning to leave? Yes. Well, that's a very good question. Um, I, I think that's the way I see it is this, and probably to use my own personal experience, because the scenario you, you, you just described right now, uh, Professor uh, Kristen, actually fits into my own personal experience. I was working, you know, fresh out of law school um, in a law firm back then, and my principal at that time was, you know, very obsessive. Um, he liked me. He wanted me around. They didn't want me to um, even go to another firm, let alone leave the country. You know, um, so once I, you, you know, you need to study your employer to know the kind of person they are. There are times when you may have other employers who are very friendly. Some of them may even be the ones telling you that. So, are you not thinking about masters? Are you not thinking about you know um, um, further degrees? So, if you have an employer like I had, who was not really interested in um, letting go of me. So what I did was this. I knew that at the end of the day, that once the visa is approved, um, the employer liked me to the extent that even if it meant that he would have to live with the reality that I was living and also have the hope that I may come back, that at that time, it was going to be out of his hands. He would have no choice but to let me go. So against that um, thinking, I mean, when I knew that once the visa arrives, this employer would have no choice but to let me go either by way of uh, study leave or by way of, for example, maybe outright resignation. Uh, what I did was I didn't presume the very worst of the employer. So I presumed that it was reasonable that he would give me um, the study leave. So I had already indicated that because I knew that that was actually the, what I was going to seek at the end of the day. If the, um, the study permit works, if it flies. And as it turned out, of course, um, it was successful. And so I now spoke to him like it was a case of ratifying what I already assumed that it was going to do unto me. So it wasn't really something that I went to him first because I know that doing that um, was probably even going to jeopardize my job and I may end up losing both ways. So not having a job and also not having a, um, a study visa. So you want to be very, very careful and very um, uh, tactical with regards to the way you deal with your, uh, your employer um, in, in that regard. It's very important. Um, okay, I think I mistakenly just put um, this, um, well, someone actually said we should put uh, the last page back up again. I was going to remove it, but it's not, uh, I'm not able to remove it. So, okay. Professor, you know yeah, I mean? so uh, Dr. Okewa is also on Twitter. I just uh, posted his Twitter handle. So you can follow him on Twitter. He's also on LinkedIn. I'm going to be posting the link to his Thank LinkedIn you. web page. So let's quickly talk or uh, turn over now to Marion. Marion is going to be asking some of the questions you guys have posted on the chat box and uh, Dr. Okewa will be responding accordingly. Over to you, Marion. Okay, thank you very much, um, Professor Gideon. Um, hi, everyone. So I'm just going to move on to the questions in the interest of time. Um, so the first question here in the chat box is a question um, from Chineye. The question is, is there a maximum or recommended number of pages for the personal statement? Uh, no, but you, you also want to be very reasonable. Uh, you don't want to write um, a tome. 
uh, or, or thesis, you know, for that purpose. I mean, you have to bear in mind that many of these guys who are processing the applications, um, they may not be inclined that much to, I mean, they have hundreds of applications that they review. So I would say that you um, put your best foot forward, you know, uh, be very concise and laconic um, in your um, personal statement. I would say anything more than two pages um, is too much. I mean, from experience, for many of my clients, two pages, but that's those two pages, um, even you, when you read it yourself, you'll be impressed with yourself as in solid, all right? So that's actually what I would recommend. Anything that goes beyond two pages uh, may be difficult, especially bearing in mind that, especially if you are being represented by a consultant or by a lawyer, um, they also have an obligation to submit what we call a legal submission, uh, which is an extended version of what you call personal statement. So you don't want to bore the um, visa processing officer with too much details. So make it very short, two pages max. Thank you very much. Um, so next question here is for Manjiri and the question is for sponsorship, is, it, is an elder brother ideal? Elder brother, yes. So that one, if you can avoid it, I will. <clears throat> and that's because you know there, there is always this idea uh, as to why do you think this person would, you know, um, notwithstanding his own personal family commitment, you know, his responsibility to his wife, to his, uh, his kids, and then he will be focusing, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> will be focusing on you. Like I said earlier, Canada doesn't want a situation where someone will be stranded economically or will have um, maybe you'll be forced to, to, to have a recourse to public funds. So if you are not able to really establish that obligation, I mean, it is customary, it is known almost everywhere in the world that parents have such obligation to their children, all right? And that sometimes, um, and I say sometimes because it's not in all cases, husband may have an obligation to, you know, assist the wife and vice versa. But when it comes to my sister, my brother, I'm not saying it's not going to fly, but it's forced under what I call taking a risk as well. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Amara, if, if I may just add a little bit, in addition to what Dr. Okewo has said, I mean, there may be situations, especially for some of us from Africa, there may be situations whereby the only person we have is our brother, right. uncle. I mean, in such a situation, you have nothing to lose. I mean, that's the best shot you have. So you can still use that. But if, if I may also add, in such a situation, if you are using a distant family member, I would strongly suggest that family member deposed to a sworn affidavit. That will be much stronger than any letter they will give you. Yeah, that is correct. I agree, absolutely, yes. Um, I don't know if it's permissible for me to share my experience too as well. Um, I used my own elder brother to get my study permit, um, mm -hmm. but I used my personal phone store as well. It just wasn't enough. It just wasn't up to like the $10,000 that was required. So I just had my elder brother, um, you know. But there's also one thing that I know that people do and that's drafting a deed of gift. Um, mm -hmm. So it's just, you just get someone who would just, you know, um, transfer the funds into your account accompanied by a deed of gift saying, you know what, I'm giving you this money you know, without any strings attached. So that, that could also fly. Yep. Good point. Okay. So I, I will move on to the next question. And this question is from Ibuku. And uh, this person goes, thank you for this insightful presentation. Is police clearance certificate required to process study permit? From my experience, no. Um, the, the issue of police clearance doesn't come up most times until permanent residency application. Uh, for study visa uh, level, um, a statement from you indicating that, I mean, for the past three or four decades or whatever age, uh, how old you are of your life in your country, you have been uh, within the law. You have not um, violated any obligation. And that, of course, you're not going to be a changed person when you get to Canada uh, in terms of, you know, having inclina inclinations to crime and all of those things. So a statement is enough to talk about your um, police record, you don't need to apply for. In fact, most times I, I would say that for study permit, um, if you put that kind of document into it, that to me is even the reason why somebody will say, maybe we need to go and find out. Why do you have to put this? <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Um, the next question is also from the same person. 
Could you also help review statement of purpose? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> so maybe, I don't know what um, African Scholars Initiative um, wants to do. I believe that that may also be something that um, um, can be done at that level. I mean, if you have volunteers um, that would assist with, with doing that. Now, for me, um, I can tell you that the level of commitment that I have, uh, especially to you know um, attend to client and all of those things, I doubt if I would have the time to you know like. Um, I mean, again, I, I I do that sometimes for some of my mentees, uh, and I think some of them are also even in this um, webinar they can actually attest to the fact that uh, once in a while I do that. But even for those guys, they know that they have to always remind me. And they have to give me at least two weeks notice, you know, um, as to when they want to back. So my schedule may not really allow me to make that open commitment, right? But I think it's something that I would be happy to be a part of at the level of the ASI. If um, there is a volunteer um, program like that, I would love to volunteer in that regard. And so in which case, it means that maybe once in a while, I can contribute my quota in terms of assisting people to review their personal statement. But I'm not making a general offer that I'm available so that people don't start inundating me with their personal statements. Uh, yeah, for at the, well, at the ASI level, um, we are not doing that yet for now, but we probably will be looking into that sometime in the future because uh, ASI is a new organization uh, basically being drawn on volunteer basis. All of us who are actually working on this are working on these things in addition to other full-time jobs we have another full-time commitment and um if we open that floodgate oh, oh, i mean we had like 130 people registered for this event today previous events we've had like 239 240 so if we open that floodgate now we don't have the capacity or resources to be able to do that but we're definitely going to consider that in the future as the organization expands and we're able to attract more volunteers especially volunteers from inward play in Canada here who may be able to commit more time in being able to do, uh, to review such documents. Thank you very much, um, Prof. Um, so the next question here is from Zainab and the question is, is it possible to get scholarship for undergraduate studies, for instance? Sorry, for instance, I graduated as a chemical engineer, but my passion is medicine and surgery. It's a long story though. Is it possible to go for a degree course in medicine and still get a scholarship? Would I be allowed to come with my child and husband? I think I'll just hand this over to Prof. <laughs> okay. So Prof, would you like me to take it question at a time? Okay, can you take it again, please? I didn't. <laughs> so uh, is it possible to get scholarship for undergraduate studies? Okay, um, at ASI, we don't deal with undergraduate programs. We deal basically with graduate programs. So I'm not in the best position to be able to provide information with regards to scholarship for undergraduate uh, programs. Um, are there scholarships for undergraduate program? I will tell you absolutely, yes, there are. Uh, but um, being an international student, your chances of being able to get such scholarship funding will be uh, more difficult. Uh, that is a little bit different at graduate level. We've had various um, webinars in the past, or we have a webinar in the past that talked about uh, funding. So I would strongly recommend that you go to our YouTube channel and take a look at the uh, webinar on, the, on graduate funding. But like I said, that is for graduate funding. ASI doesn't deal with undergrad studies, we deal with grad programs. Okay, so the next question here is, so um, she says that she graduated as a chemical engineer, but she wants to study medicine and surgery. Is it possible to go for a degree course in medicine and still get a scholarship in medicine? Um, medicine in Canada uh, is a first, it's a second degree program. I don't know what, I can't provide an um, answer to that because I don't know what the requirements are. But one thing I know for sure is that admission into medical school in Canada is very, very competitive, even for Canadian citizens. So for an international student, um, that would be a very difficult hurdle to cross. Is it possible? Yes, it is possible. Uh, how easy it is? Uh, it's not, it won't be that easy, but you can give it a try. You can contact the medical schools or do a Google search of medical schools in Canada 
and then see what the entry requirements are. But all I can tell you is that for international students who is not even presently in Canada, uh, that would be a very difficult hurdle. Okay. Um, would I be able to come with my child and husband? Um, well, if you are applying for, um, if you have a, an admission, you can apply for study permit for yourself and members of your family. The problem with that admission, I mean, that uh, I mean, um, visa application process is that um, coming with members of like the whole family will kind of raise some, yeah. um, mm -hmm. it's kind of raise, there's a red signal because the, the visa officer are probably thinking, oh, is this person not just trying to use school as an excuse to get into Canada? For people in your situation, and this is advice I would give you from experience. For people in your situation, the best advice I can give you, apply for yourself first. You, the student, apply for yourself first. When you apply, the fact that you have a family in Nigeria, wife and children or husband and children, shows that you have some ties back in Nigeria. That will make your own, admit, your own visa process easier. When you are able to get your own study permit or study visa, it becomes much easier for you to be able to apply for other members of your family. But if all of you just come at the beginning, take notes, I'm not saying it's not possible. Yeah. It's possible, I've seen people who have applied and the whole family were approved. I've also seen people, a lot more, who have applied and they were refused. Then they now have to go back and one person apply and succeed and then comes in and then applies for the others. So it depends on how you want to take it, whether you want to take it the easy way or the difficult way. The easy way is apply for yourself first. Then when you're successful, <clears throat> then others can come behind you. Thank you, Prof. Um, so I, I, I guess I missed a question before that question. Um, this question is from Hassan and his question is to support proof of funds. Is 25% payment of tuition fees advisable? For me or for Prof? I think that's okay. Well, you answered that question before. Maybe yeah, you can. I, I did. I would always recommend 60%, 60% at least. So 25% is not going to go anywhere. Okay. Um, thank you. Next question is from Eric. Um, the question is, I would like to use this medium to thank you very kindly, Dr. Okeo, for this uncommon Clara answers to issues relating to admissions in Canada. Please, can I apply for my PhD program with awaiting results of my LLM degree? Yeah, that's actually something that a school here would answer. That's not a question that um, I have control um, over. So I would imagine that um, applying <clears throat> apply for a PhD, you want to, you probably must have reached out to a couple of schools because you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. So, and one of the inquiries that you will ask those schools before making your application is this issue. You know, can I make this application uh, based on um, a waiting result? Uh, and whatever they say um, is what you should do. But I, I have no opinion on that. Um, Prof, would you like to add anything to that? Or should I just move on? Yeah, I think that's like um, Dr. Keo said, that's a decision school makes, not individuals. I mean, I can make that decision for the school. The school will probably have a policy on that. So the best bet would be to contact the school you want to apply to and see what they will say. Okay, so this is a request. Uh, Prof, kindly help to display the last slide of the presentation showing contact details thing. I think that has... That, that was, was why I did it earlier. <clears throat> so that's... Okay. um. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so... Uh, this person doesn't have a name. This person is anonymous. Please, if your um, name doesn't reflect your new name, your real name, please kindly change it. Like the name that is reflecting on Zoom. Um, because here I can only see Galaxy A6 Plus. So um, this person asks, could you please explain better, sir, based on the ties you said earlier? Is it possible to go with my kids and husband? Or can I go alone first and come back and pick them? I think that question has been answered. I'll just answer the question, yes. Next question is from... Um, Chair Maka. Well done, sir. Please, my BSc is in biochemistry, but I left the sciences entirely, did a postgraduate diploma in education and then a master's in education. I'm pursuing a PhD in education in Canada, but I'm currently working with my BSc. Would it affect my study permit? Mm. 
Okay, that seems to be so much of taking. Can you say that yes. again? Yeah, I, I, I agree with you, sir. <laughs> so I'll just start. So um, my BSc, my BSc is in biochemistry. Okay. But I left the sciences entirely. Mm-hmm. I did a postgraduate diploma in education right. and then a master's in education. Yes. I'm pursuing a PhD in education in Canada. Yes. But I'm currently working with my BSc. So I guess what this person is trying to say is she wants to pursue a PhD in education in Canada. Yeah, I mean, so far- Currently working with her BSc, would it affect my study permit? Yeah, Prof, you wanna go first? Okay, let me, let me, take, let me take on that. Um, I mean, this is, um, I think this, this situation, it's a kind of weird situation, but it's real. So somebody has a BSc, then after BSc, switch totally to something different. So it's, the situation is that she's working with her BSc, but she has like a graduate degree in education and she's not working in education. She's still working in, uh, B, I mean, with her BSc uh, in sciences. Yeah. Now she's coming to Canada for a PhD in education. So if you look at it, her choice of program in Canada is not related to her work. Neither is it related to her first degree, but there's evidence of academic progression in that particular area. Mm-hmm. Now, the situation, of course, it's um, um, the best way to address her situation is to have a very strong statement of purpose accompanying her visa application, explaining that, okay, I have a BSc in sciences, I'm working in sciences, but now I have done this academic pursuit in education, and that seems to be where I'm heading to that if I'm successful in this PhD, I intend to leave science and completely focus on it. So it's possible for individuals to have a career change. Uh It's possible for individuals to go study BS in science and then leave science completely and go into education. But you must accompany your application with a very strong statement of purpose, explaining this transition. Failure to do that may be fatal to the application. So please, have a very strong statement of purpose accompany your visa application. Yeah, I have nothing further to add. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the next question is from Agnes. Um, lawyers can represent a client in federal court for complicated cases. A consultant can go up to the appeal tribunal level when there is an issue with an application. I don't know if it's a question or a statement of fact. I think it's a reaction. Oh, a reaction. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. So for me, I think that what we are discussing here is study permit. Yeah. And I'm not aware of any kind of um, appeal tribunal for study permit. Once it is refused, uh, the solution is to do a judicial review. Uh, if you want to do a reconsideration, yes, that's um, possible. But for judicial review, only lawyers, you know, are <clears throat> only lawyers have right of audience at the federal court, not immigration consultants. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Um, before I move on to the question, next question, just a quick reminder that please follow Dr. Okeo on Twitter at Demola Okeo. Um, so the next question is from Chiamaka. Um, Prof, the scenario is exactly what I am facing too. My employer won't be happy if I am leaving. Should I include them in my SOP? Will the immigration officer verify for my employer? Um, immigration officer will not verify from your yes. employer, except if you have a document from your employer, which is part of your application process, they may contact your employer to verify the authenticity mm-hmm. of the document from your employer if they have any doubt about it. Uh, now, the employer situation, I totally understand the problem a lot of people will have, especially from African environment where the employers are more concerned with, you know, using you than you, I mean, more employers are more concerned with what you can bring to the to them than what you, than your personal development. So in this situation, it's important maybe, of course, you have to disclose in your application who your employer is. It's very important. Failure to do that will be very fertile if they find out that you did not disclose that. So disclose the employer. If the employer will not be giving you a letter, Attestifying that you're working there or you don't want to ask them for that because of fear of uh, retaliation, then forget about the letter, but include your employment in your application when you fill in the forms. In your statement of purpose, 
discuss the fact that maybe you could probably discuss this fact in your statement of purpose that uh, even though that you did not uh, have a letter from your employer, that on completion of your program, you intend to come back to Nigeria and start work with a different employer. And I think Chair Makas was the earlier person that talked about being in science and then pursuing uh, education. So in your own case, even better that, okay, I'm working in science. When I come back, I don't intend to go back there because it's different from my field. When I come back with my PhD in education, I intend to maybe uh, look for a position in a university or polytechnic to teach there with my new qualification. So that would even explain, you know, why your application, your application may be um, a, a, a leave later from your employer is not included because you're not taking a leave. You don't intend to come back there. When you come back from, uh, from your study, you intend to do something else. So these are just kind of explanation you can have in your statement of purpose to address the situation. Um, thank you, Prof. Um, next question is from Chiamaka <clears throat> again. Um, apart from my personal account, I have, I have about some money in my pension account. Can it count? Uh, can it count as part of my approval funds? I wouldn't use it, use pension funds um, for study permit purposes. I'm not saying you cannot, but um, the optic somehow it doesn't really. Um, if I were if I were a visa processing officer, pension actually implies that that's the you know, the end of days. Like what you should fall back on once you're um, out of um, uh, work and retirement, if it's what I mean. So how you want to annex the funds in your pension funds for educational purposes in Canada, I think it's a tall order. So I wouldn't use it, but again, I'm not saying you cannot, but I would classify it as one of the risky things to do. Thank you. Um, so I'm gonna move on to the next question quickly. The next question is from and the question is, um, hello, sir, I have written to many professors in Canadian universities, example, Saskatchewan University many times requesting for a PhD supervision. I have only received one response. What is the problem, sir? Is it from me? Mm -hmm. uh, 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 Mr. Giwa, that would be a very difficult question to answer since we don't even have access to the email you wrote. So we can see whether the problem is from you or it's from the other end. But um, um, if, um, if you have not received any response, I, sometimes it could be, be, be probably be, because they are very busy. Um, they didn't have time to reply. After a while, uh, send another email in response. If you don't get a response, then in this situation, I would suggest that you consider their silence as a negative um, response. And um, we've dealt with this particular issue in our previous webinar. So I'll probably refer you to uh, I'll refer you to our YouTube um, channel. Uh, if you can take time to consider our webinar on master's application and PhD application, especially one of master's application, I think we discussed, uh, uh, this was comprehensively discussed. So um, this webinar was, was basically for um, study permit application. But having said that, I will still refer you back to the webinar we had. That is our webinar number two. You'll find that on our LinkedIn, I mean, our YouTube uh, uh, page. I'm going to post, put the post up here. Then you can watch it later to see um, the comments on this. Thank you, Prof. Um, so I'm going to move on to the next question. This question is also from Giwa as well. Please advise me on how and which universities are affordable for me. I studied microbiology in both undergrad and MSc. Um, well, I think this is the case where you have to do your own research, and that is why Google is there for you. Uh, such the universities, each of the universities have their tuition fee, which is publicly accessible. So search them and then see which one is affordable for you, because you have your own fund, you have your own money, you know how much money you have and how much money you're willing to spend. So do a Google search of the universities in Canada and how much their tuitions are for international students, and then see which one is affordable for you. All right, thank you. Um, next question is from Chinaya. If you pay school fees and your visa is denied, how do you get your funds back? Um, you write to the school, of course. You, you write them and let them know that your visa is denied. And uh, in most cases, well, most schools I know here, they will often want um, proof of um, 
refusal, like the refusal letter from Citizenship and Immigration Canada, um, you send it later to them, letting them know that uh, your visa or study permit has been refused and that you want your money back. They are obligated to give you your money back. Uh, the only thing they may do, which is worst case scenario, is that they may deduct some administrative fee, which may probably be some few, a hundred or some few hundred dollars from it. But uh, contact the school, let them know that your application is refused and that you want your money back. Thank you, Prof. Um, so this is, uh, I believe, the last question from Chair Mapa. Um, doctor, please, I am expecting a research assistantship position from the school. Do I still need to pay the school fees? Also, I am not sure the letter of assistantship will be offered at the time that I am starting my study permit application. How do I go about the school fees? Well, if you're hoping to rely on the um, the payment of salaries that you're going to earn as an assistant to pay your tuition. I don't think it's uh, it might be uh, appropriate for you to even make that um, the issue right now to say that a job in Canada is what you are in fact relying on um, to pay your tuition. Don't forget that when you're applying for study permits, your focus should be study. So you don't want to do anything that would create another impression as to your purpose of visit. Because even from the message that this um, uh, Ms. Chiamaka posted here, my impression when, when reading it is that you want to come and work. And that wouldn't bode well for a study permit application. So I, I, I think that um, while it is a good idea <clears throat> that they want to give you um, assistantship position, you should use that more as a plus for your study permit application. But you must still go through or ensure you have the basic requirement. So you must still source for your own funds and then now use that assistantship letter um, as the icing on the cake to show that I'm bringing something to the table. Even before coming to Canada, they've already, they're already even making me offer of um, employment, but don't create the impression that it is the money from that employment in Canada that you want to rely on to study. Uh, I bet that many of many of the immigration officers wouldn't really um, take that lightly. They may have a fit with that. That's my take. Um, I don't know whether Prof has thoughts on that as well. I think um, I absolutely agree with what you said. I don't have anything to add. Okay, um, so there's Chinaya says, thank you, Professor Christian, Dr. Demola and Mariam for enlightening us on the study permit process. Um, so there's also one last question from Coyote. How many months prior is it advisable to submit a study permit application for a program that is starting in September? Oh, that's a good question. So that one, uh, if the program is starting in September, um, generally I would recommend uh, April, for example. Now it depends again on the program. It depends. Um, so, but on a general note, for a program that's, that that is starting in September, uh, my client should get all the documents down to me, um, March, April, because it's only in this age of COVID nineteen. Um, there are times when some applications will take forever. There are times when some applications will be processed speedily. Um, so if you submit an application in April, so you have May, June, July, and August, yeah, I believe that within the four months, the ensuing four months, you should be able to get a response. Uh, but you don't want to wait until, say, um, June ending or July for a September application. There was a time I actually submitted an application for, for a student um, on, the, I think, the end of July, but the program start date was October. And miraculously, even though I had my concerns, miraculously, the application was decided the following month, August, and it was approved. But that's like the exception. Sometimes it doesn't always work out that way. So delay may be dangerous. The earlier you apply, the better. And uh, another thing also, I mean, in light of the COVID, like you rightly said, um, it's very difficult to determine processing time. But when the processing time was still functional, what I normally advise people to do is to go online, 
check the processing time for your country or the place you're applying, then use that as a guide to determine when you want to apply. But the processing time available now is not really certain because of the COVID situation. So like um, Dr. Okewo rightly said, the earlier you apply, the better. It's much better for you to get the study permit, if successful, to get the study visa way before your program starts than your application still being there after your program has started. So um, I think um, uh, this is where we are going to stop for today. Thank you so much for uh, Dr. Okewo for your time. Uh, we really appreciate your being here today and for the uh, much detailed information you've been able to provide. And for the participants, um, I will want to let you all know that um, the video recording from this presentation is going to be available on our YouTube channel probably by latest by Monday. So uh, please, you may take time to, uh, if you, maybe for any reason, technical reason, you signed in late, you will still have opportunity to view the entire proceeding. And also because of the importance of uh, this study permit issue or study visa issue, um, ASI Canada has decided exceptionally that we are going to be having more than one webinar on this topic. So by next month, we are going to be organizing another webinar um, study permit application process also featuring another can Nigerian Canadian, Nigerian born Canadian based lawyer who we will be letting you know uh, soon. But um, we're trying to see uh, maybe to see if our next webinar is going to be more like a kind of a town hall meeting where you will have more opportunity to kind of ask questions because I believe uh, Dr. Okewo has been able to comprehensively cover the field on the legal provision or the legal requirement for, or for the proposal of uh, study permit. So we want to have a situation whereby most of the participants will have the opportunity or more opportunity to ask questions orally or in writing. So we're planning towards that and that's gonna be sometime uh, next month. So please follow us on Twitter, Facebook or Instagram so that you'll be able to uh, keep informed as to uh, our future webinars and when uh, they are scheduled, but for sure, we'll be having another webinar in March. So, uh, Dr. Keo, uh, once again, uh, thank you so much. We really appreciate your time for joining us today. And for the participants joining us from different parts of the world, thank, uh, you. thank you for your time. And uh, it's been a pleasure being with you guys. I We hope to see you again in our next webinar next month. Bye. Bye. Thank you.